begin as a subcommittee until we establish a quorum. Mr. Prieto, why don't we go ahead and uh, take item number one. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Item number one relates to a motion. Buscano Martinez requesting the city attorney to prepare an ordinance that would authorize the city to disconnect water and or electricity service at any property engaged in violation of local, state, and federal law. Very good. Let's have staff come on up and uh, help us understand how to... Good afternoon. Um, my name is Asha Greenberg. I'm an assistant city attorney, and I'm um, here to answer any questions that um, this committee has about this proposed ordinance. Um, and I just want to say, um, is this on? If the council adopts this motion, we would be pleased um, to draft the ordinance. Um, if you could move the microphone up. There you go. You can, you can do this with it here. There you go. And I just Usually I have to move it down. Okay, yeah, not here. <laughs> and then when you hear the noise, like if you ever get feedback, people make the mistake of moving it out, you got to move it forward. That that will that will that little okay. tip there. Each one has its quirks. Yeah. <laughs> so, I just wanted to say that if council chooses to adopt this motion, we'll be pleased to draft an ordinance that would accomplish the purpose of the motion, which is really to shut down illegal medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, and we will transmit an ordinance that will be legally sound and consistent with the purpose behind the ordinance, but uh, we just want to be um, aware that there would probably be litigation associated with uh, any ordinance like this. Is the uh, city currently authorized to shut off utilities for anything that is uh, illegal under our... No, we do not have an ordinance like Anaheim's. Anaheim has an ordinance that is relatively broad, and has been on the books for a long time, but our municipal code does not contain anything comparable. And uh, how does this request factor into the potential initiative, well, rather, the initiative with its potential passage that's moving statewide? Are you referring to the Adult Use of Marijuana Act yes. that um, everyone is treating as a fait accompli, but it's, um, I believe, before the Attorney General right now and um, or with the Recorder's Office, whomever is checking signatures, so we don't know whether it's going to pass or not. It might, it might not. But any ordinance that we uh, were to draft would be consistent uh, with anything that that act proposes. And the, uh, I mean, I haven't read the act, but any sense as to, uh, it, from what I understand, there's a lot of deference to local government uh, in the act as it relates to cultivation uh, and ostensibly what the illicit activity here would be with water and power is for cultivation. So is there uh, anything in the act that you're aware of that could pose a problem for us to draft an ordinance? We would review the act and make sure that anything we draft takes that act into account in the event of its passage. Okay, very good. Mr. O'Farrell, any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Ms. Greenberg, has the Anaheim ordinance ever been uh, challenged legally? No, it hasn't, but that doesn't mean that we won't be challenged. Right. We seem to sort of draw challenges like flies. Sure, and, and where I was going with that is, could that be a good template for us? Uh, but where it looks like it's uh, un, unknown, unknown at this point. It, the Anaheim Ordinance is very broad because it addresses all types of um, uses. And one thing we have to be aware of is whether the use is a residential use or a commercial use. Uh, an ordinance that is focused on commercial uses, I think, would be more defensible mm -hmm. than one that sweeps in residences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we do have some good ideas to work with, it looks like. And yes, we do. Evaluate. All right, thank you. Very good. Uh, we do, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we do have a public comment card, Mr. Spindler. Okay, doesn't look like he's in the room. Well, colleagues, let's go ahead and hold the uh, item in committee uh, and we'll go ahead and uh, bring it back in 30 days and request the uh, city attorney in conjunction with the Department of Water and Power, the CAO and the CLA to prepare a report on the could matter. We, could we make that 60 days because there will be a lot of coordination required with DWP and other. Let's entities. make it 60 days. Thank you. Great, thank you. Item number two. Item number two. Presentation from the Department of Water and Power relative to the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. Have staff from the Department of Water and Power. Good afternoon. 
Ms. Falcon, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Mr. Kwan? Good, good afternoon. Mr. Blumenfield? I am late. <laughs> Everybody? Very good, colleagues. Um, before we take this presentation and you're warming up the machine, if there's no objection, I'd like to take items three through five on consent. Hearing and seeing no objection, that shall be the order. Very good. Uh, item two. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fuentes and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Delon Kwan. I'm the manager of the Resources Development Group at the LADWP. With me is Ms. Penny Falcon, manager of the Water Conservation Policy Group. And I oversaw the preparation of the updates to the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. So this presentation today is an informational item uh, that's designed to give your committee an understanding of the state law requirements as well as, well as the elements of the document. So what's in the Urban Water Management Plan? It's a document that lays out I'm the sorry, Mr. Kwan, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Mr. Spindler, you're interrupting the meeting here. We're in during a presentation here. So if you would please take your seat. Uh, I called your name. You didn't uh, come up. And so we've moved on to item number two. No, but we recognize, uh, I recognized you when you turned it in. So Mr. Spindler, we're, I'm, I'm going to warn you now that uh, you're interrupting the meeting and uh, ask you to sit down, please. Okay, Mr. Kwan, go ahead. So uh, what is in the Urban Water Management Plan? It's the document that lays out the city's long-term uh, water resource management plan, essentially ensuring that the city is going to have adequate supplies to meet future demands um, under certain uh, climate scenarios. So shown here are the topics that we'll cover uh, in our presentation today. So just a little background, the Urban Water Management Planning Act uh, was adopted by the state legislature uh, to require a minimum level of resource assessment and future planning by water agencies. So the act... Um, requires us to file an updated plan every five years, uh, which we've been doing since 1985. By completing it every five years, it also allows us to update um, uh, you know, how we're progressing with the goals that we've set, as well as uh, implementing any type of uh, goals or changes to the goals based on change conditions in the next five years. And then compliance with the Act is a state requirement uh, to maintaining LA's eligibility to state grant funding and loans. So shown here is a listing of the public outreach efforts that we've engaged. Um, we began last November, and since then we've held six public meetings, uh, after which we've incorporated the input that we've received uh, from the public as well as stakeholders, and then we proceeded to finalize the draft document uh, following the uh, input that we've received. This slide shows some of the major accomplishments and the outreach efforts that we've accomplished. Um, although the code only requires us to hold one public hearing, uh, we've gone above and beyond uh, the code requirements uh, to ensure that the public and the stakeholders have had adequate chance to engage in the process. The remaining items that's left for us to complete the process is our Board of Commissioners' approval of the, of the, of the document and then our submittal to the state before the July 1st deadline. So what's included in the Urban Water Management Plan? The main content includes our updated water demand forecasting uh, based on the latest 2012 uh, SCAG uh, forecast. It also uh, includes a conditions of our analysis of our existing and planned supplies, uh, uh, water supplies in the future. Uh, it also uh, states our water use efficiency and conservation goals. It also contains an assessment of our water supply reliability uh, under average single dry and multi-dry years. It also includes an updated uh, water shortage contingency analysis in our plan to, to address uh, catastrophic or natural type disasters. And then we've also voluntarily included our reporting of the impacts of climate change as well as uh, water energy nexus analysis of our water supply and associated greenhouse gas emissions. So more importantly, the Urban Water Management Plan is not a standalone document. It has been built upon a number of individual planning studies, um, all of which have undergone separate uh, public outreach efforts covering the recycled water, stormwater capture, water conservation, water loss control, and groundwater. And it's these individual uh, plans that have also helped to guide our, our city policymakers uh, when they develop the Mayor's Executive Directive Number 5, as well as the Mayor's uh, Sustainability Plan. It's also these mayor's directives um, that have also established some of the water use efficiency goals and local supply development goals that we've incorporated into the 2015 update. So our preparation of the urban water management plan has been a collaborative process in which we've uh, utilized the city's one water approach. Uh, to accomplish this, we coordinated with the city's uh, one water LA 2040 plan, uh, through which we coordinate with the other city departments to develop uh, collaborative opportunities. 
We're also a participating agency in the uh, Greater uh, LA County Integrated Regional Water Management Planning Process, or IRWIM, uh, to help improve and enhance water supply reliability, as well as uh, look to improve surface water quality, flood protection, habitat conservation, and also improve recreational access for the public. And then lastly, as a MWD Metropolitan Water District member agency, we've also participated in MWD's updating of their integrated resource plan and the 2015 Regional Urban Water Management Plan, which are essentially their long-term resource plans uh, for Southern California's water supply reliability, and these have also been incorporated into our Urban Water Management Plan update. So in response to the recent historic uh, drought conditions, the mayor has taken both near and long-term actions. You see here the mayor's sustainability plan uh, calls for additional uh, gallons per capita per day reduction goals through the year 2035, as well as a 50% reduction goal in purchase imported supplemental water by the year 2025, and also a 50% source local water production goal by the year 2035. So at the state level, the governor has also issued his executive order imposing the statewide conservation mandates. So all of these goals and mandates, both at the state and local levels, uh, have been implemented into our 2015 uh, document. So our local supply program going forward is based on a capture, conserve, and reuse strategy. You see here the path um, to the future water supply reliability coming from the additional recycled water uh, used from our future groundwater replenishment projects shown here in the upper left through spreading basins. And then the additional um, stormwater capture recharge uh, shown here in the upper middle. And then both of these programs are designed to help recharge the groundwater basins. Additional conservation savings shown here in the upper right will also help to continue to offset future uh, potable water demands. And then you can see addressing the contamination down here at the very bottom where these two uh, recycled water and stormwater capture programs feed into is going to be critical uh, to our overall future local supply program. And then I'll go a little bit more into detail of each of these programs in the next couple slides. So our conservation program is going to continue to cover a wide range of behavioral change and hardware-based device uh, saving strategies, which you see them listed here. The goal in the future is to achieve between 110,100 acre feet per year up to 143,900 acre feet per year by the year 2040. From the uh, Recycle Water Master Plan document, uh, we incorporated recommendations to further develop uh, non-potable reuse or purple uh, pipe projects shown here on the left, uh, and our indirect potable reuse project, which is the advanced treatment of and recharge of the San Fernando Basin uh, project is shown here on the right. Uh, the goal uh, for Recycle Water is an additional 75,400 acre feet per year by the year 2040. From our stormwater capture master plan, uh, we identified additional future stormwater capture potential to uh, uh, double or even triple the amount of current capture that we are achieving. And we want to increase the uh, uh, stormwater capture between 68,000 acre feet up to 114,000 acre feet, depending on the, on the uh, investment scenario that we uh, end up choosing. So for the tw 2015 document, uh, we're going with the conservative approach. So as mentioned uh, earlier, the groundwater basin remediation project is going to be critical to restoring the city's full beneficial use of the uh, city's existing water rights in the San Fernando Basin. And then we're going to also augment those rights by spreading recycled water and uh, um, increasing the uh, health of the basin through additional stormwater capture. So we're also enhancing the reliability of the LA Aqueduct. Uh, the table on the bottom right here shows uh, the projected uh, LA Aqueduct deliveries under average and dry years uh, hydrologic scenarios in the future, ranging from a low in dry years of about 32,000 acre feet up to um, about 300,000 acre feet under average years. So the next two slides go to then um, show kind of the results of our reliability assessment. So this slide shows the supply portfolio to meet projected demands, assuming average hydrology conditions uh, each year to the year 2040. So you see here the projected demand from our uh, demand model uh, before additional conservation savings is expected to increase to about 675,000 acre feet by the year 2040. And that's primarily driven by the projected growth forecasted by SCAG. When we account for the mayor's sustainability plan goals for uh, gallons per capita per day and um, reduction in purchase imported water, demands have to be reduced down to about 570,000 acre feet by the year 2040. And you see here the revised uh, demand line noted here as the mayor's goal. 
So when we account for the mayor's sustainability plan goals, um, demands have to be reduced uh, through a minimum of additional conservation savings shown here in the green over time that's going to need to be uh, achieved in order to reach the mayor's goals here. <coughs> now looking at the buildup of supplies from the bottom on up, we start with the core supply coming from the LA Aqueduct shown here in the blue at close to about 300,000 acre feet. And this is based on our long-term 50-year uh, uh, average deliveries. And then projections include um, some additional savings from the Owens Lake Master Project as well as some uh, potential effects of climate change. Next is groundwater shown here in the orange. And this is expected to make up a, uh, a large part of the um, uh, portfolio, which includes the San Fernando Basin Remediation Project being online by the year 2021. And also the groundwater replenishment project coming online in the year 2024. And then uh, with the stormwater capture, allowing us to access stored water credits in the San Fernando Basin to increase um, uh, pumping uh, capabilities. And then the remaining supplies uh, are going to come from recycled water, shown here in the purple. So we're going to see that increasing over time as well. And then the remaining uh, supplies to meet the demands is going to come from our purchases from MWD. So now looking at a snapshot at the end of the planning period in the year 2040, uh, the pie chart uh, here shows the most recent five-year actual average deliveries that we've had, with MWD making up about 57% of the city's total supply, LA Aqueduct being about 29%, and then local supplies combined um, making up about 14%. The middle pie here shows the average hydrology conditions, and you can see the significance that local supplies are going to have, uh, making up about 47% of the supplies, helping to reduce our MWD purchases uh, down to about 11%. So that's about an 80% reduction uh, compared to the five-year average. And if you include also the 118,000 acre feet of historical conservation that the city has achieved over, um, over the last uh, 20 years or, or so, um, we can see that the uh, mayor's uh, goal, uh, making up more than 55, make, reducing the city's um, purchase import supplies, you can see that, 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 that we've achieved the mayor's goals in the 50% reduction, as well as the mayor's goal of having uh, more than 50% source local water, we've more than exceeded that. The pie chart on the right shows the dry year conditions, well, in LA aqueduct deliveries are significantly reduced and local supplies combined will now uh, make up about 49%. And if you include uh, historical conservation, we're about 56% uh, is going to be locally sourced. And this is still going to help to reduce our dependence on MWB purchases down to about 44%. And if you recall, in, in, in the current dry year, our purchases of MWD supply was up to like 70, 71%. So therefore, future local supply developments could play a, a large role in responding to dry year conditions and helping us to provide some uh, dependence relief on imported supplies. You can also see those future dry year conditions, we're still going to need MWD uh, to provide that reliable supplemental water to meet our dry year demands. So I want to conclude by summarizing kind of the four uh, common themes that the public comments uh, we received from our outreach efforts. So the top concern was the risk to future reliability if the city was not successful in implementing its local supply goals. We've, we believe we've addressed this concern by incorporating the mayor's uh, ED5 and sustainability city plan goals uh, into our plan, and we will update the um, urban water management plan every five years, and we can adjust any change conditions at that time. Second was the uh, groundwater contamination in the San Fernando Basin. We agree with this concern and have incorporated the remediation of the basin as a key uh, um, initiative to restoring the city's use of its full rights in the basin as well as accessing additional supplies from the groundwater replenishment project as well as the stormwater capture projects. Uh, third item was the adequacy of our local supply plans. To address this, each component of the urban water management plans, local supply development have gone through extensive prior studies, uh, such as recycled water master plan, stormwater capture master plan, conservation potential study, each of which have gone through um, a pretty extensive stakeholder engagement. And then lastly, uh, with respect to costs associated with the plan, the recent five-year um, rate action included funding towards the mayor's local supply uh, development goals that were identified here in our 2015 update. Uh, and then to minimize the cost to our ratepayers, we're going to continue to pursue um, uh, PRPs, potential responsible parties, to help mitigate some of the cost impacts to the ratepayers. We're going to pursue grant funding opportunities such as Prop 1 and, and other funding partnerships. And then a complete list of all the public comments that we received and that we've provided response to is attached to the appendices to our uh, final document. So what's left? Um, June 7th, next week, um, we have this item going to our DWP board for adoption. 
and then no later than 30 days after adoption or by July 1st we need to submit this to the state and then no later than 30 days after adoption we need to submit copies to the uh, um, uh, other cities in the surrounding areas that we serve as well as um, uh, sending a state co uh, copy to the state library and with that that concludes our presentation we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have I'm always curious about the, um, you started talking about the San Fernando Valley groundwater and how that's going to play out. Is there any more specifics on, on, on how we're going to get there that, that's either in the plan? I mean, I saw it on page, whatever page it was on, about the, the groundwater cleanup. And could you help me understand the assumptions that are made there and, and what the plan is to, to get that water that we're counting on? From the groundwater out of the San Fernando Valley. Yeah. So this slide shows the um, portfolio over the next 25 years. So you can see by the year 2021, which is when um, the remediation project is, is expected to come online. So you can see the bump up there just before well, in the year 2021, that's when the project is expected to come online. So we expect to then increase or get to our full um, you know, pumping right in the basin. So that pumping right is about 109,000 acre feet. So when you add on the subsequent projects that will come online, the groundwater replenishment project, as well as the stormwater capture projects, that's going to continue to help augment additional pumping capability. So, so I think we're going to get the full pumping rights from the, from the San Fernando Valley Act. That's the current plan. So with the funding uh, rate action that currently um, just got passed, the five-year rate action, some of that funding does go towards funding the remediation cleanup at least over the next five years for some of the design. And, um, um, and I think when you get closer to uh, the out years, then you got the construction costs coming in too. So what I, I thought that the, the project itself to clean up all the, the, the perchlorates in the groundwater the valley was, was, was a couple of billion dollars, like $1.5 or $2 billion. Maybe I'm getting the wrong numbers and that we had about 100 million in so, so the cost estimates I've heard is about 600 million ish for the remediation project and we're pursuing um, some prop one funding uh, for to, to help mitigate some of the the costs I, I, I think we're pursuing roughly about half of that and we submitted a pre-application for that funding last year um, I guess maybe maybe the, the difference is that some of the numbers refer to what would it take to clean up the whole basin, and then there's the, the amount that it would clean up. The San Fernando. Just the, yeah. the, the that project to get that. So maybe that's, I need to go back and look at some of those numbers, but that's, that's good news on that. Um, and that's assuming, I guess you're not assuming where the money's coming from, you're just assuming it's about a $600 million. Project. It's $600 million, but but like Delon said, we have already submitted a pre-application to the state for Prop 1 funding, and we were working very closely. And so that is one project that we are looking to get assistance from the state on for, for this project moving forward. We've done a lot of outreach and communication um, with all sorts of people to ensure that we're on target to get funding and assistance on that. Um, another question, just maybe a little out of left field, but on the, the, the projects where you're using, you're, you're cleaning up the water, Thermal pipes were used. I've been reading a lot lately about some of the new technology that allows you to clean it up on site and then reuse it in your your toilets and, uh, and irrigation. Do we have any of that baked into this, or it's all based on the assumption of centralized? Uh, so, so the purple pipe projects here are more for the um, uh, NPR type use, non potable reuse. So the uh, type of on-site use that you're talking about, I think that might be more um, potentially that might be eligible for like the TAP program. Is that well, it is for some of our conservation. If if an individual customer wanted to do that, we are partnering with the Bureau of Sanitation um, through the uh, One Water Project. We are looking at those the other opportunities that you're talking about. It's more um, on-site. Sometimes they call them scalping type plants, but where you uh, pull the water out. Uh, clean it up and reuse it for the customers in that 
immediate vicinity. Where you save is on uh, pumping cost or piping and infrastructure to send it all the way from a treatment plant, a wastewater treatment plant that's cleaned up and move it back. So we are looking at all that. There's a whole lot of new technology and innovation on that topic. Stuff that has incredible promise. I don't know Absolutely. If can deliver. Yes. Um, but that could be game changing for some of this. And, and I, is there any of that assumed in these in this chart, or is that all? I don't, I don't believe those on site are, are, are factored in here. These are all purple pipe projects that require new infrastructure you know, to mm -hmm. deliver to the large customers um, right. that sign on for recycled water. So now, that's, that's not to say as we move forward with the One Water and new innovation and technology, because again, this is a 30-year a planning document um, that, that we redo every five years. So in between that five-year timeline, we are looking at modifying things as new technology comes on board. So if we see an area where it's more cost effective for us to do a, a, uh, um, a neighborhood or a pilot project uh, versus doing the bigger treatment project at Hyperion um, and recycled project Hyperion, we'll make that swap and do that. Great. So. Well, you guys are working with us at the Israel Los Angeles Task Force with the Milken School and the, and the rainwater mm -hmm. capture. All of that is stuff that's not wouldn't be reflected in any of these. Right. right. Those are all new innovation, is, and as those projects move forward, we get done with those pilots for gray water, rainwater capture. Those will all be moving into there. Yes. Great. Thank you. Sure. Mr. O'Farrell? Just an observation based on what you just said, Bob. I think that this uh, sort of portfolio, um, I think these colors are going to change a lot in the coming years based mm -hmm. on the new technologies that are coming. It'll be, I, want, I hope. The purple line widens, and I hope the orange line widens greatly, and I think it can, and I think it will. Uh, yeah, but thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question. So the Los Angeles aqueduct, obviously, I mean, if I were doing the chart, I, I would put conservation first in the loading order, and then LA aqueduct. Uh, LA, LA aqueduct is, is such a tremendous asset to Los Angeles, and obviously this is an average year projection. How much deliveries did we take from the Los Angeles Aqueduct uh, this past uh, year, water year? Was it 34,000 acre feet close. thereabout? I think it's close to that. Yeah. And so uh, the 275,000, 270,000 thereabouts uh, acre feet, is, is that uh, m more than our average? Uh, this is our long-term average, and that's what the state requires us to, I mean, it, we have a flexibility to base it on, so we base this on our fifth, last 50 years hydrology going forward, and this is how MWD does their forecast too, so it's all based on your long-term historical average. That, that That's all we can go off of. And yeah, that, it just seems that we have a pretty consistent uh, sort of uh, good water year average, and when you get the bump up there, uh, I just sort of wonder how you get more out of the Los Angeles aqueduct. Is that, it uh, that, because we're, the, the, we because we're, not, we're, we're doing less for dust control. I shouldn't say less. We're doing more efficient, efficient more dust efficient. control. That's when you're going to realize the, the additional water? Yeah. Correct. That's about 20,000 acre feet there that in the next um, five years, five, six years. And the sort of planning for recycled water, um, how much recycled water do we send to the ocean today? I know it's a sanitation question, but, I mean, uh, you, you all are working with them in acre feet. Do we know? Anybody from sanitation here? I, don't think so. I think if you look at Hyperion, majority of the flows from Hyperion are, is going out into the ocean. Yeah. But I think so, so when you plan here, the, the, the purple there, is that, um, you know, when you get to 2040 and you, you're taking, you project that you're taking as much as that is, is that 80% of what comes out of our water treatment facilities? Is that 75%, 50%, any, any sense? No, it, that, that purple pipe or that purple line right there isn't, doesn't include what's being reviewed right now in the One Water Plan um, of trying to uh, reuse more of what's happening at Hyperion. So that hasn't been factored in. So you're going to see that that bar increase as uh, we look for the cost-effective projects coming out of the One Water for the treatment plants and trying to expand recycled water use and using and, it more in our northern territory where we don't have to pump it back up. Right, and and, so. and I and I sort of understand the challenges with recycled water, but I just wonder. You know, with your out-year projections, understanding it's a 30-year document, it's going to be revised every five years, is the goal to get 100% of what's being put into the, being uh, put out of these plants back into some sort of 
productive use, um, or is that not realistic? I think we're, we're, we're aware of it, and I think the, um, you, won't, you won't get there for full use until you get to direct potable reuse. So until those regulations are developed and the guidelines are established and the State Resources Board, you know, Approves and, those guidelines. I, I, I don't think we have the demands there currently, unless you go to DPR. And, and we're getting close, right? I mean, the, there isn't there some uh, yes. the dilution strategy. Folks are beginning to be okay with that. And uh, tertiary treatment. I mean, that's pretty darn good water. If we mix it up with even better water, uh, I just wonder if we can. Because today, you know, the, everything goes out. Maybe it's eighty-five percent, ninety percent of all of the, the recycled water goes out into the ocean. When we do our next five-year update, if things progress far enough, we could see a shift in the portfolio right. going forward. So. Got it. Okay, very good. Uh, colleagues, any additional comments or questions? Yep. Very good. Well, the report is informational, as you know, because we don't direct the Department of Water and Power. Very few people know that. Um, so it's a presentation. We thank you for your courtesy for coming to share it with us for informational purposes only. There is a, a speaker card. Uh, Mr. Williams? Good afternoon. Dr. Tom Williams, Sierra Club, Water Committee, and also Citizens Coalition for Safe Community. Three basic things. Number one, the storm water from single family dwellings. Calculation is that you need to hold 420 gallons for a thousand square foot roof. Guess what? The city of Los Angeles only requires two rain barrels of total. 80 gallons. So we got a lot of room to grow and to get even more water. I have about 600 gallons worth of storage and irrigation from storm water. Uh, next one. Indirect potable reuse means that I get treated sewage from San Fernando Valley because I live in Northeast LA and the pumps, the well pumps will provide me with treated sewage effluent via the groundwater. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, we'll go ahead and file that report. Don't go anywhere. We're going to go to public comment next uh, because that brings us to the end of the, the agenda. Go ahead for public comment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, on Friday, there was a major change in the state of California. It's called the California Air Resources Board Rules for Methane Controls. And that will be applied during the next year and a half or so for all methane emissions from all areas within the state of California. AQMD has already started up on it because we have a rule called 1173 for volatile organic compounds, which includes methane, but they specifically exclude it from that particular rule. So we will be able to determine how much methane and other gases are coming into the windows along Jefferson, the windows along West Adams, and even Elysio Canyon, maybe. So there's going to be some major changes in the city. Should have some response, especially if you're from the San Fernando Valley and or South Central. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Colleagues, I think that brings us to the end of our agenda, Mr. Preto. Is that right? Yes, it does. Very good. We're adjourned. <laughs>